All right. Well, today we are on with Patrick. Uh, you are in LA, correct? Yep, I'm in Los Angeles, Beverlywood area. Yep. Cool. Are you are you originally from Los Angeles? No, I'm actually from Sarasota, Florida, um, and I I went to school in Boston, and then I came out here. So yeah. Cool. How do you how do you end up in in Boston and then and then LA? That's those are uh, from Florida. You're kind of you're kind of all over the map there. Yeah. So after I, in high school, I was a musician. I've been a musician pretty much my whole life. Um, so I went to Berklee College of Music, and in at Berklee College of Music, I that's where I actually got into programming because I was taking a course called Max MSP, um, which you know was a kind of a. It's not really like the same as normal traditional programming, but it, it, it's kind of programming in a way. Um, but yeah, so at, at Berkeley, I got into programming. Um, and ever since then, I, so I, d I moved out to LA because it's a good spot for both music and programming. And yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's why I'm here, yeah. So, so what, did you, what did you study at, at uh, you said Berkeley College of Music? Yeah, so Berkeley College of Music, I studied electronic production and design, that's one major. Uh -huh. I do, um, and I did music business marketing as well. Um, so at Berkeley, electronic production and design basically consists of synthesis, studio technologies, um, of course, actually production. So using digital audio workstations and how to use them well, and um, you know, mixing, mastering, things like that. Um, basically, yeah, synthesis is like signal flow, and like basically of sound generators and processors, and you just you just sort of use those to modify different parts of different. It's very, it's very modular actually. Right. Like, it, you know, it sounds like a lot of, like a lot of uh, logic type stuff. Uh, it yeah. sounds like a natural sort of transition from that into, into uh, software development. Like a lot of the same, same sort of uh, like crossover yeah. skill sets, the same sort of thought processes. Yeah, exactly. And actually I, what I've recently learned um, is that you can actually make like an entire synth in the in the browser using the like the audio <laughs> API. So that's something I'm really interested in doing, um, and I think I'm going to attempt to make some synths. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to have a I'm going to have a try at it. I don't know when, but I will. <laughs> awesome. So so how did you how did you jump from from a lot of the, the, the music stuff into more of the, the hardcore uh, web programming type stuff? Well, I mean, I've always like, liked computers. I actually use, I make electronic music. Um, uh -huh. and, you know, as someone who just really, I like sort of systemized things. I don't know how to describe that, but I mean, Ableton is my program of choice. And it's basically like a little system that lets you uh, work around and work with things. And I just think um, the entire concept that, you know, a program allows for such creativity um, mm -hmm. is, is really inspiring. So the whole concept of like computer programs enabling people to be more creative and, and create and make things that are, you know, that could be, you know, another person's, you know, r almost religious experience. Like that's how, you know, music feels for a lot of people. And that's how I feel about music. And I think the concept of taking technology and making art is just really an incredible concept. So that's what really got me into it. I, I think, but I also just like really like, you know, logic and puzzle solving um, yeah. puzzles. Puzzles yeah, are just, made, yeah. So it's like, it was just a, a good mix. Cause I know that, you know, if I, if I, if I, if I code something that like, I, like I said, the synth, I would like to, you know, make a synth. That's something I, I want to make. Um, I haven't, I just thought about it recently because I saw this video online, but um, yeah, I think, I think that's my next thing. Cause I want, I want to help people be creative with, with code. So I think that would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and programming is actually a, a highly creative activity contrary to, to, I think a lot of uh, the popular perception out there. I think, um, so, yeah, okay. no, I, I was just going to say, I think that like people, think that things that are logical aren't uh, like they think that the log like the whole right brain left brain I, I don't know if I really believe that uh, uh -huh. I, I think that there's you know I think that logic and creativity can go hand in hand I don't think it's has to be separate but yeah. absolutely absolutely um, so 
So how did you, how did you make that? When, when was your first real introduction into, into sort of hardcore programming and, and uh, I mean, I, I, I learned a little bit of JavaScript in college. Um, uh -huh. I, I, I did take a boot camp um, mm -hmm. from September through December of 2017. I was at General Assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, yeah, I took a boot, the web development boot camp there. That's when I like got really into it. It was, you know, I would say that I understood it a lot better afterwards than I did like during. Um, because you know it's just so much material in three months. Um, right, they they cram it all in. I mean, there's just no yeah. way to process all of that yeah. just all at once. It's just such a flood of information. Um, exactly. So it was really like after I got out that I really got into it in a way. Um, but I, I needed I needed that sort of like kickstart, and I think that that's what was good about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it was really, it was really after, after, right after Berkeley, basically, I, I was in, I was in Boston for the summer, but then came September, I, I moved to LA and went straight to the boot camp. So, yeah. So, so from the boot camp, you, you, I noticed you had some, some, some solid startup experience, uh, but from the boot camp, did you go straight into, into startup life or, or were there yeah. more transition period in there? Yeah, actually, so I worked at plantbased.io, as, uh, as you probably saw on my resume. Um, plantbased.io is a, you know, full stack, Mern stack application that was helped to, it's, it's built to help people find vegan products. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I, I was working there for about three months. We built the, the full MVP. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, I basically we... I, I wasn't able to be paid anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Funding issues, right? So right. Um, I had to, yeah. But but yeah, it was it was. I mean, it was a great it was a great experience. Um, still, you know, still in contact with the CEO. He's, he's a great guy. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. So so what what specific technologies were you working with at at PlantBase, and what were your responsibilities in relation to those those technologies? So, sure. So it was Mern stack. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, obviously the node is redundant as we always uh, uh -huh. as we talk about. Um, but yeah, so MongoDB, Express, React, of course, node, because it's Express. Uh -huh. but, um, and yeah, so basically my role was, at least at the beginning, it was the back end. Um, I was handling the seeding all the so we didn't have the data that we needed to create the application we had the data structure we had our models but we didn't have the actual data um and that was pretty uh we had to like make our own data and so i just basically made a bunch of constructor functions and seeded them into the database um and when it, once they're in the database we just sort of built the the routes to hit that data basically just you know give us all the json that we need just to build the application and you know, it, once we did that, we, we needed like some sort of uh, way for people to edit the data that weren't developers, right? So I, I, I basically, I found this technology called Mongo Sheets. Um, I even wrote documentation on it. It's on my GitHub. But Mongo Sheets is basically like you can take a Google Sheet and actually perform full CRUD operations on a database with a Google Sheet. It's a little bit complicated, but uh -huh. it, it's good for people that, you know, don't want to code, but want to be able to edit a database. So. And, and don't want to dive into like a, a real database. Yeah, exactly. So, right. And in that case, that was, that was, that was good. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I found out how to do that. I wrote documentation. It was actually, I wrote documentation for the team, but I was mm -hmm. like, okay, well now I have documentation. So I just put it up on my GitHub. Um, yeah. And so after that, I, you know, was out of work for a little bit. I just was practicing coding mainly, of course, applying. Uh, but then I got contacted on LinkedIn and this has been my third cohort at a UCLA coding bootcamp, uh, mm -hmm. UCLA coding bootcamp. And I'm just a teaching assistant there. And yeah, that's what I've been doing lately. So, so, so why don't you tell me a little bit about, about your, your experience teaching? Um, sure. You know, like what are, what are the, the, Topics that you guys cover, um, I mean, and and some of your interactions with with students. What do you like? What do you what do you, what do you not like? What do you sort of yeah. gain from from that experience? Sure. Um, so 
as, as a as a teaching assistant, we we deal with a lot of um, students who are they're, they're they're really difficult sometimes, and that's okay. Um, I think that's just like a normal thing because it's a stressful place, right? Like when you when you're learning code like in three months, like that's probably the the only negative side is that sometimes you know sometimes students are reluctant to like take advice for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's really the only downside. Um, I, I love, I love the job itself. Um, and yeah, so we actually, what we teach is we teach JavaScript primarily, just mm -hmm. almost all JavaScript. We teach, you know, full stack development. So we start out with, obviously we just do the basics. We do HTML, CSS, um, obviously navigating the terminal, um, you know, just bash. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, and we, we do like a lot of just basic stuff at the beginning. And then eventually what we do is we get into like using jQuery and just manipulating uh, them with like cool jQuery stuff. And then yeah. um, after that, we, we get into like, we get into node. Um, you know, we do, we did APIs with jQuery at that point. I'm trying to, right. you know, recall the exact order of all these things. Right. But then we do, then we do node and express and setting up servers and basically just, start into back end and then we tie it together by teaching them react to the front end you know setting up the proxy and um basically just pushing you know sorry my roommate is distracting me he's he's on the phone too and i apologize um i okay. did be on the phone but yeah so um yeah basically we just talk about you know hitting the back end and the front end and axios is what we use i mean it, we just we just tie it together at that point and then we tell them to build stuff. Like we just have three different projects. Yeah. The first project is just basically like, um, just, you know, with, uh, jQuery and, um, you know, Axio, not Axios, uh, Ajax calls with jQuery. Um, yeah. So it, it, we just, we slowly tie the back end to the front end. Um, but it, it takes a bit because like they don't understand what they're doing at the beginning with with J with ajax they don't realize they're hitting someone else back in i was like okay uh -huh. so this, now we're going to be calling our own <laughs> uh -huh. our own api that's i mean that's the way i try to make it make sense for them but yeah yeah that, that makes sense and, and you guys you it's a full mern stack right so you guys are doing mongo as well in there? yeah mongo db we do we do sequelize too um uh -huh. and we do yeah, so we we do Mongo Mongoose as an ODM, SQLize as an ORM, um, base, just basic uh, basic ORMs, ODMs, you know. <laughs> cool. So, uh, anything else you you, you kind of want to highlight in your background, or, or or can we dive into some more technical talk? Hmm. Um, I mean, no, not really. I mean, my, my background. Oh, I mean, right now I'm, I'm working freelance uh, at on vinyl media. I can't really uh -huh. say what I'm working on because it's an NDA, but um, respect that. Yeah. <laughs> I um, won't, I won't press. Yeah. So, but you know, uh, I, I am I'm not doing a journalist, so I, you don't know. <laughs> I'm still, I'm, uh, I'm allowed to put it on my LinkedIn. Right. So uh -huh. that's what I did. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Cool. So, so, so your primary areas of expertise, like you said, are is kind of the Mern stack. It's Mongo, Express, React, and, yeah. and Node. Um, yeah. So, so let's just maybe walk through some of that stuff. In, sure. In, why don't Why don't you tell me uh, a little bit about your experience with Mongo, and, and and why don't we start with with sort of the difference between like an SQL and a and a no SQL database. <laughs> Sure. I mean, so a, a SQL database is a relational, otherwise known as relational, right? Uh -huh. So it, it's data stored in tables, right? Right. Like it's just a, it's a, it's a different concept. You have primary keys and foreign keys, and uh -huh. the with the NoSQL database, you have you you can have like these IDs attached to it, but they're documents. They're essentially uh -huh. just JavaScript objects, which you know if you're doing like. If, like if you're doing a very simple database, like just like a list of products, for example, that's a perfect application for Mongoose or, you know, for Mongo database, I think. It's also, uh -huh. Mongoose is really easy to like, like if you need to change your schema, you don't have to like roll back your entire database. You can, it's right. 
there's 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 benefits for especially for startup culture like right um, where, that, where with a lot of startups you don't even know what types of data you're going to be needing like what what's going to be relevant in right. six months let alone two years right so, so coming at that from like a, a very rigid like sql type database uh, really limits your flexibility as your company and your product pivots over over time yeah exactly and yeah so C sql databases yeah like you said they're rigid um and it, it, like as far as agile you know workflow i think mongoose is like really good for that because you don't know what you're going to be doing and it, it that's sort of the point like it, it could be completely different down the line but and that's that's what we did in, in plant-based was you know at the very beginning we, we had a user model by the end of it there was no user model because we realized we didn't need it um People didn't want to sign in, so. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. Basically, it, it's 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 definitely uh, it's it's very JavaScript friendly. The uh, the like the Mongo is very JavaScript. It, it is JavaScript, so it's just JavaScript objects. So it's just like it's 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 just nice sometimes, especially if it's very simple. Um, but yeah, I mean, the other thing is, you know, I. I think as long as your data is not super relational, like if your data is very relational inherently, like it just makes, like if I had, if I was making an application where like students could sign up and teachers could sign up and there were lessons, I could do that with Mongo and it would work with references, but I don't know if that's the best way to do it, right? right. You, could, you could do Mongoose references, but it might make more sense to have, it's very relational data, like a teacher can have many students, a student, I guess you maybe could have many teachers. That could be a many to many, in which case you need like a join table. Um, uh -huh. You know, so I definitely think it depends on what your data is, you know, that I would never be like only Mongo or only SQL. It really right. Depends. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so can you tell me a little bit about indexing in, in, in Mongo? Indexing? Yeah. So, I mean, basically, I mean, my understanding of it, I, I, I am not an expert at, like the whole concept of, but it's just that it's attaching, I think it's attaching like an index to, to each one. So if you need like unique, if you need unique value pairs, like, so like if you need a user name and an email to be like unique together in a way, uh -huh. like it should be unique, then uh -huh. you, to enforce that you could, you could add, you know, indexes. And um, that's my basic understanding of it. I am, I, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that I know that. I'd have to look and, that up. And they're also they're also speed components. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. They're also speed components that 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 indexing provides. Uh, okay. In terms, of, in terms of looking things up. Okay, um, I, I wasn't aware of that actually. So. So so let's jump into some Express and and Node stuff. We, we'll just we'll just go ahead and, and combine those. Um, cool. So cool. so. Uh, why don't you just give me a brief overview of 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 node and 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 why it's useful and and why why you think it's it's sort of become so popular sure um I would say that node is really useful in that so it's like it's mainly for either like a utility uh -huh. or server, right like you you don't have to write servers in node, but it's most of the time i mean in my experience like i've never really i've used node for like I've made a few little node applications that weren't servers, but for the most part, it was, it was basically just servers. Um, and you know, I, I have written a server in HTTP, the HTTP package. Don't, not a fan, much more of a fan of express. Um, why, way, why is that? Well, express is just way more intuitive. Like uh -huh. just, it just makes a lot more sense. Um, visually, you know, you can, you can just write out the HTTP verb and the path, right? Like, app.get to this uh -huh. right? app.post to this you know and you know having your your uh your body come in on rec.body it's just like it's way more i don't like the whole http on ready state change it's just like uh, I'm right. not um, so so you mentioned you mentioned rec uh in in, in terms of of express js can you, can you tell me some more about route handlers in, in express sure um so I mean, the best way for me to explain routes is probably visually with code, but I can do that in a, in a, in a bit. Um, so with 
I mean, every HTTP request has a, a verb and a URI, right? Uh -huh. So, um, you know, if you make a request to like a post request, right? So there's a verb post to, I don't know, slash users. Let's say you're creating a user. Uh, you have your request object and then your response object, right? So your, your request object handles what's coming in from the, from the client, right? There's also other things that are on the request object besides the body. Like you could have files, you could have, um, you could have a lot of different things. I mean, that's not built into Express, but you can, you can, you, there's plugins for like, you know, accepting files. Um, so it'd be like rec.files. There's also, you know, uh, rec.param, so you could pass data like directly into the URL of the, uh, or the URI of the backend route, um, which is useful sometimes. Um, but yeah, so as far as the request object goes, there's just a lot available, and I just think it's interesting because you can just go to the documentation and see like what you can do with Express. And same thing with the response. You know, you can respond to a route with, you know, JSON. Um, you can respond with if you do res.send, you can respond with like a lot of different things. Uh, it'll like if you put a number in res.send, it'll like default to a status code, even though you could do res.status. And there's just a lot of different ways to respond. I mean, my most common way to respond has been JSON and like res.send. That's just what I normally do. Um, but yeah, I think the it's just uh, Express is really easy to understand the you know, requests and response just because it's, it's a very simple format, just having the callback of, you know, your app.get or app.post routes just being those controller functions, right? So, so in, in Node, can you, can, you, can you tell me a little bit about threading in Node and... and uh, I actually can't. I mean, I actually, I, I, I'm not a huge, I, I don't know about that. There, there is really. <laughs> okay, so that, uh, then that's, a, that's a good trick question there because I, I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I guess I guess that, that may have been a little bit of a, a trick question. I can rethink how I, I phrased that. Um, it's okay. So, so can you tell me about node callback? Or actually, let's talk about promises. Um, okay, sure. Can you tell me about promises? Sure. I mean, promises have essentially three states. There's pending, uh, rejected, and resolved, right? So... Uh -huh. It's for asynchronous things. Um, I mean, you could put a promise for something that's not asynchronous. It would be pointless. But <laughs> So if we actually, with my token validation, I used a promise, basically. Um, and I, if you, you know, whatever you pass to, um, whatever you pass to, when you create a promise, you, you give it a, a function uh, that one of, the, one of the callbacks is, you know, reject and one of the callbacks is resolve whatever you pass to resolve is going to be available on your dot then um, so that's saying like when this is done right dot then you're gonna have the success or dot success I believe well uh -huh. I always use dot then and dot catch but there's dot set there's dot success there's there's like a bunch of them there's dot uh, error I think I think dot error I think one of them is dot error for, for at least for um, yeah at least for the the JavaScript concept that I don't know if there's you know promises in, the, in another language or anything but um, but yeah so with uh, with the dot you know catch that's where you get whatever you pass to your reject function um, and yeah I, I, I mean it's just useful for you can chain a bunch of dot thens together that's nice um, you can th there's because every promise is you know like a dot then will return a promise right so that just lets you chain another dot then. So um, I think that's useful. Uh, it's just an easier way to read something that would otherwise be a callback. I mean, that's right. way, like, I think that's the main benefit is readability because uh -huh. there's callback hell. I'm sure you're right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so avoiding that like pyramid of callbacks. Yeah. You know? any, any pyramid of doom is, is, is very much, um, yeah. you, you really want to avoid something like that. So, yeah. and, and it helps with things like modularization and, and like I said, avoiding that pyramid of doom. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you get into, there are all sorts of ways to get in, get into pyramids of doom, callbacks, nested if statements, yeah. nested loops. I mean, there are all sorts of things that you really want to separate out for 
yeah. readability sake and, and just avoiding avoiding mistakes. Um, yeah. I mean, if I have like one callback, I'll use it. But if I'm starting to get into a bunch of callbacks, then I'll... Then right. I'll yeah, once you start to get into that, you know, third layer there, it starts to get a little dicey. Um, yeah, exactly. So let's let's jump into some some React stuff. Uh, can you tell me about yeah. React component uh, lifecycle life cycle methods? Right. So I mean, these are available on class components only, as I'm sure you know. Um, but lifecycle methods are basically like the, every component has a life cycle, right? So basically, it hasn't the life cycle meaning like either it hasn't mounted, it's going to mount, yeah. uh, it has mounted, um, it's unmounting. Um, uh -huh. Render is a lifecycle method. Um, so yeah, I mean, all of these things that are happening are they happen in a certain order, and we need right. to, to manipulate that order, and that's and, and do things before things mount or when they mount. Or, right. And that's what lifecycle methods are really useful for. I so mean, they're, they're pr it's pretty much the system telling you, okay, here are things that are going to happen, and you can you can set off certain events or, or do whatever you want to do when, when uh, these, these various events occur. Exactly. Um, it's, it's, it's also the few, <laughs> because they're built in, you, this is already bound to it, so we don't have uh -huh. to like bind this to it in order to not write it as an arrow function, which is nice. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and yeah, uh, there is, because it's built in, like, it's just the binding of this is, is already done for you, which is really, I, I just think that's nice. So you can just use this, even though it's not an arrow function. So uh, can you tell me about uh, pure functional components in, in React? So pure functional components are perfect for accepting data and rendering. That's it. Uh -huh. Like nothing else. You pass data down. It's like, okay, render props that username, right? Um, whatever it is. I mean, it, it, it's, it's nice because you, you don't want to have everything have state. That would just right. be really bad. Uh, right. So if it doesn't have state, there's no point. It, it, it's literally just to make your code look simpler. You know, if it's just rendering, why, why have a huge thing at JSX when you can have, you know, separate components that have their own nested components that are just rendering. And I think that as long as you're just passing the right data, that's, that's, I mean, that, it's, it, I think the, the, uh, the benefit of functional components is, is very semantic in the name. Like it, it's just a right. pure functional, right? All it right. does is no, no right. side effects. It doesn't affect anything else. You can string things together really, you're chain things together really nicely. Um, yeah. Super easy to understand, super modular. Yeah, exactly. The just accepts data. <laughs> and yeah. And so. spits stuff out the other end. Right. So obviously I think for the most part, I mean, maybe besides app, if you're just rendering a React router, but like at least all your pages are probably going to be, I mean, for me, I always make them as class components and then they just render a bunch of, uh, besides forms, forms I always still do as a class component just for, because they have state, right? But, uh -huh. but as far as everything else, like, you know, almost everything that's just rendering, I, I just, I just use functional components. Yeah. So, so two more uh, questions, and then we'll dive into some some code here. Uh, sure. Can you tell me a little bit about higher order components? Uh, higher order components? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, I've 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 made higher order functions. I, I never heard of the term higher order components. Sorry, I, I meant to say functions. Okay. Uh, so. um, that's okay. Yeah. So, I mean, a higher order function would just be a function that has either like a callback or it returns a new function. So like um, if I, all the array methods, right? Those are all higher order functions because they are not all of them, but I, I believe most of them accept a callback. Right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, basically it's just a function. The whole point is to, is to abstract out all these actions into like one sort of general action, right? And so, um, that's the best way I can describe it is, is it's more general, right? Um, like if you have a function that runs a bunch of other functions and then you want to return a new function when that's, you know, done or it's, it's good for, you know, like callbacks are good for asynchronous things. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's my understanding of higher order functions. So why don't, and, and sorry, higher, higher order functions are, are, 
essentially functions that, like you said, they take functions as as arguments or return functions uh, uh, in their in their return statement. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you, you sort of nailed it there, uh, and they're and they're really good for for encapsulating sort of general functionality yeah. that is used throughout a, a an application. Yeah. So can you tell me about the the uh, the DOM or the the domain object model? Document object model. Uh, is it called domain object? I thought it was document yeah. object model. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so document object model. Um, it, I mean, the entire document of a web page is modeled in an object. If you just go into your Chrome and just type document, you can see that. Well, you, if you just do regular console.log document, you know, then you're going to see what looks like HTML. But if you do console.dir document, you can actually see what's actually available. Um, and yes, I mean, basically just a huge object that allows us manipulate it, to manipulate what we see on the web page, what it looks like, content. I mean, there's just so much available. Hard to really sum up. Um, but yeah, there's just, I mean, manipulating the DOM is an inherent part of web development. Um, right. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's, it's definitely, it's just got a lot of stuff available, like a lot of different event handlers. You can, you know, you can do document dot, you know, on, or, you know, document dot get element by ID dot on uh, blur or something, right? Like there's just a bunch of. Event uh, what you see on the web page, the content, and how it works. Mm -hmm. So let's let's dive into some some code here. Uh, okay. So you want to? Uh, I believe you have some some code on your your yeah, sure. computer that we're we're just gonna. This is a little little Merge stack application that you you actually just whipped up. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it's just, it's basically a, a small little example of how to, how to do, you know, JOT authentication. I don't know if you're familiar with, with JWT's JOTs, um, but it's just, they're called JSON web tokens. And uh, yeah. Stateless, you know, no, no session maintenance because the, the JOT itself actually contains all the user data. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, you can do everything you need with a JOT. Um, but yeah, so I, the first time I learned about JOTs, I actually uh, was taught to store them in local storage, and I think a lot of people do that, but it's actually not a good idea. Um, because if I have like a, if I have, if I'm loading like Bootstrap or something, let's just say someone was a bad person and, you know, made a, made a malicious pull request into Bootstrap, and let's say someone who is managing those pull requests uh, did not, um, really take a, like a, take a good look, right? Um, let's just say I used a CDN. Uh, if I used a CDN for like Bootstrap or something and I, you know, put it up here somewhere. Um, and then when I, that, that, I mean, that's, that's code on your computer that can run, right? So that means it can pull from local storage if it's running on your domain, right? Um, and they can theoretically, you know, pull all your tokens from local storage and just, make post requests to whatever server it wants, right? So that's like a dangerous thing about storing your jots in local storage. So what I did was I stored them in, you know, in the cookies, um, which, so if I, let me, uh, let me go ahead and sign up. Who, who should I sign up as? Uh, I think you used Crofefe last time we spoke. Yeah, let me, okay. I'm gonna get rid of all my users, make sure I remove them all. Okay, cool. So, all right, I'll, I'll sign up as Crofefe again. Make, make sure you spell that properly. That, that, that is 100% spelled correct. There's no okay. validation right now. I did not do any regular expressions to validate these and make them more like, you know. How, how might you do that? I, I mean, I'd probably use match um, uh -huh. and, and just pass a regular expression. I, I, you know, regular, regular expressions are something I need to work on a lot more. Something yeah, I mean, I mean, regular expressions are... are, are a whole another subject of, yeah. of study and while, while, while a lot of programmers 
sort of use them, quote, use them, they don't really understand what's going on uh, on a theoretical level of, 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 of yeah. real So in my experience, as long as you, you like are able to practically use them in, in, in simple cases like, like validation, it's, it, it, it's generally okay without yeah. having to get into like the, the sort of chocolate hierarchy linguistics um, yeah um, understanding how they sort of fit into to the larger theoretical picture there Absolutely. so uh, yeah so can can you want to open up uh, I think you're in you're in visual studio right yeah yeah so this is this is my code right here um, and uh, as you can see my, my secrets also cofefe but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll go over how this works in a second. What I'll do is I'll sign up cafe. And as you can see, here's the my this is my my token right here. Um, this is my JSON web token. Um, it's and it's stored in a cookie, and that's that's just generally safer from uh, cross-site scripting attacks. And, but yeah, so as you can see, it says welcome cafe, and I'll log out, and there goes my cookie. But uh, let's let's go to um, the code and let's talk about it. Okay. So here's my server file. Um, basically I, you know, just bring in, you know, express, make my app. Uh, I got cookie parser so I can, you know, get my cookies on my request object. Um, I got this, which is basically allowing me to have that environment. Oh, I don't know why. Um, okay. Um, yeah, and then this is my connection to you know MongoDB. There it is, right? I'm just I'm just running locally using Mongod right now, but yeah. So, anyways, um, and then this is this is Morgan. Uh, that just lets us log you know these these requests to the the terminal, um, and you know it just gives us our, our our verb and our URI and status code, how long it took, etc. Um, of course, you know, I got to be able to pass data to, you know, my request objects. So I have that. Um, and then I'm also signing the cookie with this secret, right? Um, uh, which is, as you know, right now it's Cafefe. Um, but I have to say this so that, you know, I don't upload this to GitHub. Um, cause I know that there's some people just do like giant searches for secret keys and, <laughs> or supposedly that's what I've been told. I don't know if it's true, but. Yeah, um, obviously not a good idea to upload your secret keys to GitHub. And then um, here's my user routes, right? And I'll go into the user routes and really explain how I have my code set up in a second. But then of course, if I was deployed, I would probably have a config bar that contains the actual port. Um, but because that's undefined right here, this is gonna be what actually gets there is 3001. So yeah, it's listening on 3001. And then, you know, I have my client code. This is just a basic, you know, I'm using React router, React dash router dash DOM, I mean, of course, but um, I have three pages and a nav bar, pretty simple. Um, we'll go into the front end in a sec, but I'll go to the routes first, right? Cool, so this is my, I use the, I like the express router a lot more than, um, you know, I, I see people sometimes export a function and then just pass app down. Um, and that's totally fine. Like, you know, if that's what you like, then do that. But personally, I like the Express Router a lot. Um, I think it's simple, and I think it makes more sense. Which is, you know, instead of exporting an object, you're exporting a. I mean, instead of exporting a function, you're exporting an object, router object. But yeah, so basically, all my user routes get prepended with this, you know, slash users. Um, and so if I'm going to do, you know, a post to slash in here or post to slash sign up, right? That's actually slash user slash sign up. Uh -huh. um, this is slash user slash login. And then this is slash users, et cetera. You get the idea. But yeah, I like to separate my controller functions from my actual, uh, from my routes themselves, um, just because I think it's easier to understand, you know, what function is attached to what. And, you know, this makes more sense to have like just a word here rather than just a variable representing the, the function than, you know, having an entire huge routes file. I'm not a huge fan of that because then you'd have right. to have a model there too. And then it's just. And, and it's, it's, it's always a good practice just to pull your code apart 
you know, as much as possible and make everything separated out and explicit um, yeah. in terms of maintainability, readability, uh, you know, if you got a bug somewhere in there, it, it's, it's, it, everything is encapsulated in a, in a yeah. way that is, that is very much manageable as opposed to, you know, cramming everything into one file or function and yeah. then, you know, something breaks or you, you find a bug and you go in and, and change a bunch of stuff, but then it, you know, it breaks something over here and then you have to go yeah. and fix that. And then that, cause you didn't encapsulate anything or, or separate anything else anything out uh, uh you go and fix that bug and then it breaks another it breaks something exactly. else you know in a in a in a uh different part of the app so so absolutely i, I like where your head is at and in, 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 in that thought process there cool yeah thank you um yeah no i think you know it just i when i want to give someone some code i want them to be able to make it bigger than it is um like obviously this would be overkill if I just had one route, right? Like, right. Uh, if there, there'd be no purpose to do this um, with, with one route. If I was making like a, I don't know, like a GraphQL API or something. <laughs> uh. But with this, it makes sense, you know, to have a lot of cookies. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, a lot, of, this might, I was just reading this while I said that, but a lot of uh, functions uh, that are from a different, um, from a different file. And I just, I just destructured them out. Um, I probably could have done like uh, star, or, you know, to, to, to grab all, but um, whatever, that's okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, so we'll go to the, the controller function. Okay. So here's my controller functions. This is my cookie check. This is my sign up. This is my login. And then here's my log out. Um, just exporting an object of all these functions. Uh, and I also, I separated my, you know, again, just trying to separate my concerns because if I ever want to make tokens for something else, I'd want to have it in a separate file, not just like if I wanted to make a token for, I don't know, it could be anything, like um, but a specific token. I, I, I don't want it to be, um, I don't want it to be just available for the users. Um, but yeah, so the first thing that happens is, you know, if I, the first thing that happens is I, I do the sign up, right? So if I go to, I do a post request to slash sign up and I hit the sign up function, right? So if I go into here, I go into sign up, I take out the body from my request object. You know, I, I, I like to destructure as we talked about. Um, uh -huh. It's probably a little unnecessary here, but it's okay. Um, so then I create a user, you know, my user model with the body. I'll go to the user model real quick so we can look at that. So this is my user schema. Um, I wanted these to be, you know, a unique pair, the email and username. Right. So that was the indexing that we talked about. Right. Uh, and then, so before it saves, what it says is, okay, the current user is this, right? Whatever user we're saving. And basically, if they change their password, go to the next thing, right? Um, and then otherwise, like we're going to, you know, let's let's create their their password, right? Um, so let's uh, let's apply some salt, which is a random string, to um, you know the, the password hashing, right? So this is the salt right here. Um, so we hash the password. This is the whatever password it is. Uh, it auto generates the salt, right? So we're generating the salt like this. It's just it, it knows what it stores the salt, the actual random string in memory, um, and then basically, of course, we're doing some error error handling, and then basically resetting what the user password is and then uh, hitting the next piece of middleware. And then, um, so this is the, the compare password method. Basically, bcrypt comes with a compare function and you can just take you know, a certain password, compare it against the actual hash password and see if it's a match. And if it's a match, then it hits the callback. And um, yeah, so, Let's go to the controller. That'll make that make more sense. So we, 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 we create a user with the body, right? And then we create a token from the user. So let's look at that token service real quick. So here's my create token. I just made it like really short one line function just because uh -huh. nothing. Um, but yeah, literally just takes in a user object, right? And just creates a JSON web token out of that user object. And that's, that's what <laughs> and Kofefe. Uh, yep, with Kofefe, as you can see. Um, 
So yeah, that secret is important just to make it more secure for sure. Um, obviously now that this is going to be filmed, I'm going to change it from Kofafe to something else, but. <laughs> so, um, so can you talk about that, that promise in there? Sure. So, so basically it takes some time for, you know, JWT to verify that right. the token is, you know, is correct or not. Right. So you, you give it a token and it's going to say, Hey, uh, what, what user is this, you know, what, what is the, the data that is coming from? That's what verify is. The right. verify is right. it's not like verifying. It's really just saying, give me like the encoded data. Right. Um, so th this returns, you know, an object, right. And the object is going to be the user. Obviously, if there's an error, I want to reject that error. And this is going to be passed to my catch. This will be passed to my then, right? Uh -huh. So I, I'm, I'm just doing a ternary right here saying like, hey, if there's an error, reject it. Otherwise, right. give, me, give me, you know, pass my user to dot then, right? And, and, and you're just checking if that, that error exists. That's all. Exactly. That's it, just common error handling. I think it, right. it's important. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's basically what happens. So, you know, when we write it, we say like valid token, pass the token, and then we can chain a dot then and a dot catch, which is the nice part, right? So it's really, the whole point of this promise is to not use callbacks. Uh, let me go to my route, sorry. Oh, controller. Right. Callback hell. Right. Um, so we create the token. We make a cookie. Um, I would put this on when I actually deploy this to a server. But this is saying that it's got to be accessible over HTTPS only, right? Um, I said it so that the cookie's age is an hour and that it's only accessible, accessible from the same origin. So this is like sort of what makes it so that, um, you know, it's, it's not vulnerable to attacks. Um, and then I redirect, right? Um, so we'll go to that. Let's go to my user slash authorized. Actually, it's this, right? So we sign up and then we actually go to this function, right? So then on the next request object, I have signed cookies um, because they're signed on the, on the back end. And then uh, the token is taken out of there, right? And I say, hey, if there is a token, let's see if there's a valid, let's see if it's valid, right? So this is where that promise comes in, right? So after it you know, gets the object from token, um, it takes out the user and the username from the response, and then I'm saying, okay, from that token, do we have a user in the database that matches that username? And if we do, then give me that, you know, user with that username and email and just send the username and email. And that's what I sent to the front end. Um, even though I only rendered, you know, the username, the emails, I have that available in the, in the front end. Um, and then of course, error handling and right. if there's no token, that means that it probably expired or whatever no, just got a log so, so I, I think you 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 covered a lot of a lot of this stuff uh mm -hmm. pretty early and, and, and did a nice job do you want to you want to hop over into uh sort of the more front end side sure um yeah let's go to the app okay so basically this is my yeah, you know, there it is. entry page yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, nothing nothing crazy it's um I probably am going to refactor this eventually, but right now this is doing what I want it to do. So uh, at least until then, but basically the first thing that happens is this component will mount, right? And it says, okay, call our this dot set user data function, right? So this is sort of like, I, I like to, to do my, my setting of user data in the top level component, because as you know, it's best to pass data down than pass functions down to let us pass data back up. Totally possible, but, I don't, it's better to, you know, have things receive data than having things change data way up here, right? So. Yeah, one way yeah. data flows is is much more uh, desirable just in terms of management and yeah. uh, uh, code organization. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Having an understanding of what's going on at the state at any given moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely useful, like, to know how to pass a function down to like one and have it pass data back up. But it's very rare that I ever want to actually do that. Um, right. It's like, I think for the most part, it's, it's just bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically, if we have no user, right? So we're setting it to NOLA first. So that's, that's, this is gonna happen, right? 
um, no matter what, this is this part will happen because this is we're saying, hey, there, there definitely isn't a user yet, but we want to find out, right? So then we're saying, okay, let's do a get request to slash user slash authorized, which was that cookie check function, um, right? And say, okay, include the cookie in the request, right? That's you have to pass that, otherwise the cookie is you're not going to get your cookies on your request. Um, and then basically, you know, I said. I did, I, I did a uh, res.json error object, right? I did like an error. Um, and so I said, hey, if there's, a, you know, if there's an error, then there's, no, then there's no user and the login failed. Otherwise, um, there is a user, right? And the login failed is false, right? So then hit the callback, which, is, which will be this, right? Because that's what we passed here. I'm passing CB because, you know, set state is asynchronous. It takes time. And right. there's a default callback. And so I just made the callback of my set state the same callback of my actual set user data function. It's, it's quick, it's quick, but it's still asynchronous. You can't guarantee that it's gonna happen right away. Exactly, so I, I always just, you know, use the callback for that. Um, I wish there was promise support for it. I mean, it'd be kind of nice if you could say this.setState.then, um, but. <laughs> yeah. Readability would be would go way through the roof there. Yeah, but anything yeah. that reads like an English sentence, is, I think, is really really nice. Um, yeah, so exactly. This dot set state, then do this. I mean, it's it's yeah. super great. And so. Catch any errors. That, I mean, yeah, that would be, that'd, be, that'd be really nice. But you know, I'll I'll have to like you know DM we'll, Dan we'll, Adamov for that or something. Yeah, we'll, we'll petition Facebook for that. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but okay, so yeah, and then it, obviously this is also a promise. So if this you know catches any errors, then let's uh let's say that there's no user and the login failed. And uh, the reason I'm doing this whole login failed thing is that I I want this whole action, this whole this is happening immediately, right? And so this whole thing is asynchronous, and I basically want to default it so that login failed true, so that it. So that this basic, because this takes time, I want this to say, like, I want this to happen and then finally render. Because what was happening before is it would like render the login and then render the page. Because it, because I have this ternary, right? But at the time that it first rendered, like just dealing with these, this life cycle, like the render is one of the life cycle methods and basically it hit this render before it was really ready. So I basically said, okay, if if you know if we don't have a, a a user, then render you know the dash. If we have a user, render the dashboard. If we don't have one, render the login page. But this was rendering um, like immediately, so which is not not good because you know it, we could have a user. It just takes time, right? So right. that's why. I'm doing that. um, and yeah, so otherwise it just says loading. Um, it was, it's it's kind of a janky fix. That's something that I'll probably fix later and make it make it look nicer. But um, yeah, so this is uh, slash user slash authorized, and then I'm just passing you know set user data down here in, in case I want to set it somewhere else. Um, but yeah, uh, and then I also have wait. So did you want me to go to like? There's nothing really crazy about the dashboard. I mean, yeah, I was just going to ask you though to look through some of those those pages and 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 just sure. talk about anything interesting in there before we before we wrap up here. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I'll show you the sign up page. So I, I just use Material UI. Like, mm -hmm. there's like a default sort of Material UI thing that I used, and I just modified that code because um, I, I like the way Material UI looks. I think it's clean and. It's, it's a, I like the system that they have built with their styling, and I think it's interesting. But um, yeah, so I guess probably the most interesting part of the sign-up page is my handle change function. Um, so on change, like every one of these is is manipulating the you know the state on every single change. Um, right. My change. So I mean, I can pull this up if you want, and uh, we can we can take a look at this. So it is console logging the state change. So I'll go to the sign-up page, and, so you can see this. So I'll just clear that real quick. And so we'll just say, going on. yeah, uh, A, so I'll look at email, A. Um, same thing with here, like C, username, C, right? Uh, password, T. So basically, um, with this whole thing, 
every time I type something, first what happens is, um, this is a sort of generic handle change function, right? And it takes in the event object and whatever value you want to pass it, right? So in this case, I want to change email and state, right? So this is, first it says, okay, take out the target from you know, the event object and then take the value, right? So we can just get the value of what we're typing. And then also pass a name. And we said, okay, well, the first time we passed it, you know, a string of email, right? So we went in here and said, okay, let's change state email, like we'll change the email, this.state.email, right? Uh, and give it whatever value we're giving it. And then it's, just, it's really as simple as that. I mean, there's, right. there's nothing crazy. Each one of these just has a different value. It's changing. Um, and then uh, I have to figure out what's going wrong with my form invalid function, but this is supposed to make my button disabled um, when, when there's no email and no username um, password. Like if, and also if the password doesn't, um, you know, basically if this entire statement is, is you know, true, then it's, it's invalid. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if the password doesn't equal like what you're saying password confirmation is. Um, but yeah, obviously I have to check to see if that's true first because, you know, empty password does equal empty password. <laughs> um, if I was to just put, you know, without this part, then that would be really bad. Uh, uh -huh. Then you could just submit empty because, I mean, those are both true, right? No. <laughs> um, like if you say empty strings is equal to empty strings, it's definitely a true statement. <laughs> Um, but yeah, well, so then Java, I just think, JavaScript can be a little bit weird about stuff like that. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, JavaScript is also like too forgiving, uh, what I've realized. Um, I, and I'm used to it being really forgiving. So like I've, I've done a tiny bit of TypeScript, but I was just like, whoa, this is really weird constraining. My, I felt like I was in a straight jacket, you know? Um, uh -huh. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm personally much more of a fan of, of the, the more rigid languages. Um, JavaScript gives me, vanilla JavaScript gives me a little bit of anxiety. I don't blame you. Um, <laughs> I like, I definitely see the purpose in being rigid because it's just going to save you down the line, right? Like, yeah. um, obviously if you're just making something really small, like it doesn't really matter. Um, right. But, but like it, in, in large code bases, I imagine having uh, no restrictions and having data type conversion all the time by accident. Like that's just really bad. You should not be able to concatenate strings in my opinion. Like I, I don't like, I, I use interpolation because I don't like the fact yeah. that you can get strings together. I think that's a, that's just really bad, but. Did, have you had a bad experience with that or something? No, I just don't like the way it looks too. Wow. Like a string plus another string. And it's just, it's unreadable. I find like you have to like, account for spaces without like you'll it's just annoying and i think interpolation is just a million times better but mm -hmm. that's you know we all have personal opinions and yeah, yeah there there are some languages where string concatenation looks looks really nice uh, okay and then and then somewhere where it, it can be a bit more of a nightmare i guess i would say javascript it's more of a nightmare personally yeah. um yeah but yeah, so then basically I just make a post request to user slash sign up when I submit this, right? I prevent the page from doing a full page refresh because uh, this has a form, you know, and if there's a form, you know, if you hit a submit, func uh, submit button, then it's going to do a full page refresh if you don't prevent it from doing so. Um, yeah, that'd be bad. That'd be very bad for a spa because the whole point is to not do a full page refresh. Um, but yeah, so I'm making a post request to slash user slash sign up. Um, and I'm, you know, passing this dot state, passing the, uh, the cookie if there is one. Um, and then, so yeah, and then I'm saying if there's, you know, if like we, if we get data back, right. The dot then if we get data back with the response, right. If the status is good, then let's set user data. Right. So that's why I was passing the, the set user data function from app. Um, and then basically I'm actually passing real data this time. So it's not going to, this time it's going to be actual data. Right. And then I, and then I reroute to, 
the I just reroute to localhost 3000, right? Um, which will take me to the dashboard this time because uh-huh. now we have set user data and this isn't the callback, so this is making sure that in app we actually have changed it, right? So this is in that in a callback like that, right? So it's it's really this, right? Um, but yeah, so basically what we expect to happen is this, right? So when when we actually sign up, this comes in as true this time, right? Um, actually, no, this one. This is the uh, this is the one that we expect to happen, right? Because this is the user coming in as true this time, um, and then yeah, this is for when we have a cookie but we haven't signed in. So that's what this one is for. But this one is for when we uh, have are just signing up, right? So when we sign up, the there's no user. Uh, I mean, there is a user <laughs> because we hit the set user data and passed the, the user to there. And then we set the state with the user um, and you know, set login failed to false. And we hit the callback and then it reroutes. Right? So we go back to the dashboard. This is where it comes because as you know, right down here, this path says, hey, if there is a user, render the dashboard. Right. If there is on the login page. So, so yeah. before we before we we wrap up here, is there any anything else, or 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 was that? I mean, I think you 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 did a really solid job, kind of walking through a lot of that and and, and giving a, a solid overview. Was there anything else yeah. in particular, or? Thank you. Uh, I mean, there's just a login page that does basically the exact same thing, but change. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean. Basically, I have it set up so that when you sign up, it automatically log you, logs you in. And if you're logging in, then of course, it just logs you in. Um, right. But other than that, there's, there's, there's nothing crazy about it. Um, it's, this is just like a, a basic example of, you know, authentication with, with Jots. And I think it's interesting that there's no sessions and that we don't have to do like express session or do any session management, um, which, is, which is nice. Um, it's just all the data is in that in that job, so yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, nothing else in particular. It's a, I think this is a pretty simple setup. Um, I'm probably gonna refactor some of the, the front end um, just to make it look nicer. Uh-huh. Um, like, Because I think I could definitely refactor this part and get it working in a way simpler function. But this was just the way I, I, I quickly bootstrapped up the application. So, cool. Yeah. Well, uh, Thank you. you can hop off that screen now. Cool. I'll do that then.